Duke University. This week on Office Hours. Tiny particles can hold big secrets. Haiyan Gao, chair of Duke's physics department, probes inside atoms to study the structure and spin of neutrons. One aim of her research is to design experiments that test for the existence of a new fifth fundamental force of nature. While growing up in Shanghai, Gao's father encouraged her to pursue physics, recounting stories of female Chinese physicist Qian Xiang Wu, who came to the U.S. in the 1930s and helped scientists unravel the chain of reactions needed to build the atomic bomb. I knew that to make new discoveries, I would have to work with the spin of the neutron, Gao says. The neutron could be a wonderful laboratory where physicists discover new physics and new forces of nature. Gao joins us today to take your questions on her research. Hi, and welcome to Office Hours. My name is Ashley Yeager, and I'm a science writer in Duke's Office of News and Communications. Joining us today is physicist and chair of the physics department, Haiyan Gao. She studies the neutron, using it to probe new forces of nature. Haiyan, why don't you start by telling us what forces in nature we already know about? Yeah, I'm very happy to do that. So um, there are four fundamental forces we already know about, and some of them actually we are more familiar with than others. For example, gravitational force, gravity, it is something we are very familiar with because we experience that every day. And um, the second kind is electromagnetic force, which we all very familiar with, the lights, you know, the magnets. And the, the third one is a little bit less familiar, but of course we experience that every day, every moment, which is so-called strong force. Now, strong force is the force which is responsible for the fact that you and I are sitting here because we have a lot of atoms in our bodies, and atoms has a nucleus at the center of the atom, and the nucleus are made of neutrons and protons. And the force which is responsible for binding them into nucleus is the strong force. And the same picture also holds that a neutron and a proton are also the way they are because of the strong force which bind the quark together to give us a neutron and a proton which form nucleus. And the fourth force is a little bit less uh, known to us in our daily life, which is the so-called nuclear uh, weak force. Now that force is um, responsible for the fact that um, neutron decays into a proton and the electron and anti-electron neutrino. Now the name can be misleading because that you may think weak force is weak compared with everything else we just talked about, but that is actually not true. The weakest force we know uh, so far is actually gravity. So if I give you um, some ideas, say I'm going to say my strong force, the interaction, the, the str strength is one, and my weak force compared with strong force is 10 to minus six or 10 to minus seven. But my gravitational force is actually 10 to minus 36. Okay. okay. So if we had to convert that into like billions or, um, so 10 to the minus six, that's a billion? That's one billion. Right, right, right. right. So 10 to the minus 36, that's, I mean, I don't even know. Is there a word for that? I, I don't know. I mean, it's just <laughs> very, very weak. So the point is that because mm -hmm. gravity is so weak, mm -hmm. so physicists, you know, we like to make things simple, mm -hmm. right? And that's basically how we look at our job. And because gravity is so out of range with all the other three forces, so we have not been successful in unifying all the four forces. So, okay. so far the theory we have is the standard model of particle physics, which will allow you to unify electromagnetic, strong interaction, and the weak interaction. Okay. So then, if you can't unify all the forces, is that why you need another force or more? Well, that is, you can say that to some extent. And the, the reason we need, uh, we need or we think they are new forces is really because uh, we do not really understand everything we have okay. seen in nature. And this model, as I mentioned, so-called mm -hmm. standard model of particle physics, which is a beautiful model and which is extremely successful in describing pretty much not everything, but a lot of what we actually uh, uh, have done in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. But it cannot describe, um, for example, why 73 or 74% 
uh, in the universe is actually dark energy. Why 22% ish are dark matter? Why visible matter is only 4%? Okay. Standard model can, at this moment, actually do not have answer for that. And also, for example, why the universe now is predominantly matter mm -hmm. instead of matter and antimatter? And that is something else that standard model cannot tell us. So, what people, what physicists are trying to do or have done very creatively is to extend standard models by introducing new physics. For example, they will add additional symmetries to the model, right, which will allow you to explain some of the things I mentioned, which otherwise cannot be explained. But however, um, what happens is when you uh, extend the standard model to including extended symmetry, and this symmetry will, uh, in the model will be broken at the higher energy uh, region, which we don't really live in the high energy region, mm -hmm. But in the lower energy region where we live, and it will give rise to new particles, okay. and which will give you new interactions. And that's why we're trying to, in order to find out whether those kind of extensions are correct or not correct, and we wanted to look for some of those new particles, those new models actually will uh, predict. If we can find that, that will tell us, you know, this model actually is not bad okay. because it predicts something and I find it. And to look for new particle, one way is to look at new interaction, new force. Okay, okay. So I want to back up. You mentioned that you and I are only 4%. We make up 4% of the universe. The, the um, visible matter, the, right. The visible matter in the universe. Right. Can you describe a little bit about that? I mean, that's not very much. Yeah, that is, um, uh, I'm obviously not an expert on that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, in interestingly, uh, my research um, at this moment um, has a lot to do with trying to understand uh, Four percent of the uh, uh, universe, which is the visible <laughs> matter, like neutron and the proton. But this is based on um, uh, a large body of observation from mm -hmm. cosmology and cosmic uh, wave background and some other uh, astrophysics uh, uh, observation, which shows. And this actually more and more refined analysis from those observation really seem to be able to tell us a, a, a more accurately now how much is the so-called dark energy and how much is the so-called dark matter. Okay. And some of the uh, uh, experiment people are, are working on looking for those new particles is we hope that will give us hint or idea uh, maybe they are these kind of new particles are responsible for dark matter uh, and dark energy. Mm -hmm. And that's the motivation to do okay. a lot of this kind of research work. But your work fo focuses more on the matter of everyday life, so neutrons, right? Neutrons, right. But, you know, as I, as in, in the introduction it mentioned, we, we also are interested in trying to uh, understand, um, you know, physics beyond the standard model. Mm -hmm. And that's why some of my work are related to looking for symmetry breaking and looking for new physics, okay. like new force or like looking for new, you know, uh, charge conjugation and parity violation or, 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 or origins or mechanisms. Okay. And so in terms of, are you looking for a specific force? Well, uh, very good question. So uh, specifically in our uh, uh, experiment, in our laboratory, uh, we realized that what we have, okay, the apparatus was built not specifically f to look for new force. Mm -hmm. Although I have, in fact, um, around 2009, I spent quite some time thinking about uh, how actually uh, I can use the apparatus we have to do some of this kind of new force search. Mm -hmm. And then I got busy, and so about a year ago, and we realized that that one particular kind of force we can look, and we already have the apparatus to do that. And so in this case, what we're trying to look is that imagine if you have a polarized neutron, and you have an unpolarized neutron, okay? So if you... Can I interrupt you? What's a... What Define what you mean by polarized. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, polarized means that... Um, you know, if you think about a top, you can spin mm -hmm. a top, right? So you can think about neutron as a, a top, which mm -hmm. has a, a, you know, can spin. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, just like neutron mass or neutron, well, neutron charge is zero, it's neutral. But neutron actually has this very interesting and very useful intrinsic uh, property, and we call spin. And the way to think about this is just like the, the particle spins around some kind of self-axis, okay? And so the idea to polarize it, imagine when I do experiment, I need to have more than one neutron to work with. So I will have a collection of neutrons, and I would like them to be lined up 
okay? And so I want all the neutron spin to line up in the same way, so they're all spinning in the same way. So the uh, axis they're spinning are all pointing in the same way. So, um, and this way I can do certain experiment to look for certain phenomena, and how do you determine the direction? We use a, uh, we use a magnetic field to uh, orient the spin direction. So that's how we define the direction okay. for the alignment. So in terms of polarization, all of the neutrons are spinning in the same direction? That's, that's what we like to accomplish in the <laughs> ideal case, which means everybody line up. So you have a 100% polarization. Okay. But in practice, I would say we are pretty happy when this number is much larger than zero and okay. maybe not quite one. <laughs> okay. But it can never go beyond one. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Beyond 100%. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so in terms of looking at this, this new, um, looking for this new right. force, you can't necessarily use just a neutron, right? Because it de decays right, pretty quickly. Right. Yeah, very, very good point. Um, you know, neutron is, as in the introduction, already said it's a wonderful laboratory, and I really, I feel like my whole career, as we shared in my office, is nothing but just trying to study a, a, a neutron. Um, yes, and uh, fortunately and unfortunately, um, neutron decays. And because neutron decays, and the lifetime is about 15 minutes, so that make your job of trying to understand everything about neutron very difficult because, you know, it is very difficult to picture any kind of experiment which you can down, you can be done in 15 minutes or, or shorter. It's almost impossible. But on the other hand, because for the same reason, because neutron decays, you actually can use that to look for this kind of new physics because a lot of new physics, for one reason or another, seem to have a preference for weak interaction. Okay. So they break certain symmetries in weak interaction, and that's how you actually can use neutron because neutron decays, and the reason it decays is the weak interaction. Hmm. And to do my work, and I want to use something very similar to neutron, but stable. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and particularly because I want to play with the polarization or the alignment of the uh, neutron spin. So that's why the best in my opinion, the best approximation I can find in this case is helium-3. Helium-3 nucleus has two protons and one neutron. I think we have a cartoon of that or a picture. Maybe we could take a look at that and you could explain what we're seeing. Okay. So um, you were explaining that the helium-3 atom has protons and neutrons. Right. So, right. so in this cartoon, what, what right. are we looking at? Yeah. Um, so what you're looking at is helium-3 nucleus. And inside this helium-3 nucleus, as we said earlier, nucleus are made of nucleons, mm -hmm. and nucleons are neutrons and protons. Mm -hmm. So in the case of helium-3, three, three represent there are three nucleons. Okay. In this case, we have two protons and one neutron. Now, helium-3, just like neutron, also has this very interesting property, which is called spin. Mm -hmm. And the spin uh, is also one half, means that if you apply a magnetic field, it can point in along the field, or it can also point in opposite to the magnetic field. Okay. So that is spin one half okay. of system. Now, in this case, it is, remember, I wanted to use um, something to represent, looks like a, a, helium, a, a neutron, which is being polarized. In this picture, because helium-3 has two protons, and the two protons actually, they like to be in a, 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 a configuration where one of the protons spin and the other proton spin are actually anti-aligned. Okay. So they kind of cancel out. If you think about two protons, it's like they're not aligned. Okay. So that's why when helium-3 spin is aligned, what you have is essentially this picture works 90% of the time that the neutron spin is aligned. Okay. So, and, and then you have the stable system, and you can do, you know, you can ask your graduate students to work 24 hours a day, right? <laughs> Seven days a week. I'm joking. But, um, and so the point is that you have a lot of time now to uh, work on your experiment. You don't have to worry about, I have to finish everything in 15 minutes, you know? Right, <laughs> right. right, okay. right, right. And so you have built an experiment with helium-3 right. in your lab here at Duke, right. is that correct? Right. Yeah. Okay, so we actually have a question from Judd. He asks by, by email. The experimental device in that photo, which was in the beginning, mm -hmm. looks simple and scaled to a tabletop. Right. I thought everything in particle physics now was about giant, expensive particle smashers. Right. So, yeah, I would like uh, to thank um, the uh, um, um, the person who actually provided this question. I think this is a very, very uh, good question, 
And this actually shows the uh, beauty of tabletop experiment. Yes, absolutely, um, the experiment uh, we have done or we are working in our laboratory is definitely a tabletop. The picture shows the, uh, the main apparatus. And what the picture does not show is our laser system, which is, again, is like uh, a box two feet by one feet or a little bit more than that. So everything is tabletop. And so what's very, very interesting is that when, it, when you think about uh, new physics, remember I, I talked about early on in terms of people know the standard model of physics does not have everything. So there must be new physics. And it's just a matter of how we look for them and in a convincing way to show the evidence for new physics. And the way to look for new physics, uh, you can go to extremely higher energy or, or region like LHC, Large Hadron Collider, where people you know, really reach the, uh, uh, you are at the uh, high energy frontier. But one actually can also go to low energy, but high precision kind of measurement using a uh, weak interaction, so-called symmetry breaking, like the kind of experiment we are talking about, which actually, interestingly, in the end, the new physics you're trying to probe are either the same or complementary. Okay. And people, in fact, uh, Carl Weinman, who um, is a Nobel laureate, and he and the collaborators did atomic so-called parity violation experiment, and in the end, the kind of physics they probe and is the same or very, very similar to the kind of experiment some of my collaborators are working on using parity violation electron scattering using 10 GeV, 6 GeV electron beam, as well as people did that as slack or labs before, like 100 GeV. Okay. And the physics you're probing are essentially the same physics. Okay. Right. So you're just you're using different uh, systems okay. and using different observables. Okay. So the idea then is to come up with a more complete standard model depending on which experiment you use. I think the idea is people need to do all these experiments because in the end, say for example, Ashley, you work at LHC and you, you come out and jumping and dancing and say, I discover new physics. And I will say, that's great, Ashley, but you know, I'm going to see whether what you have seen actually makes sense in my experiment mm -hmm. at low energies. Okay. So the point of view is you want to do all this kind of experiment. Looking at, it's like elephant. You have to look from different ways. <laughs> yeah. So you get the whole picture, right? Otherwise you will say, oh, the elephant is just one long nose mm -hmm. or one huge leg. But you have to do all these experiments. And fortunately, most of the time they are complementary. So this way it will let you um, be confident about this new physics is indeed there or this supersymmetry model is correct or not correct. Okay, okay. So let's back up just a little bit. You grew up in China and you, you told me earlier that your father was a big influence on you. What did he do to spur your interest in science? Well, my father is an interesting um, person. Um, he is, uh, um, I have a lot of affection for my father whenever I talk to him sometimes, you know. Um, <laughs> He, um, he is a very uh, a kind person, and he, he was actually uh, trained to be a writer, but he never really um, got the kind of opportunity to pursue his you know, uh, uh, professional training. And, and my joke, the joke in my family is that you know, my father, probably his math was not very good <laughs> when he was a student. So my mother is the, uh, 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 I see my mother has much better mathematics skill. But my dad um, has a lot of admiration for scientists, and particularly uh, female scientists. And I think maybe because he has two daughters, and so he always um, wanted to inspire us, to motivate us. So he likes to tell story about very famous, accomplished women physicists. OK. Right. And so I think the introduction mentioned one of uh, a very famous Chinese physicist. Could you tell us a little bit about her and her research? Yeah, sure. Um, well, everybody calls her Madame Wu, mm -hmm. uh, C.S. Wu. And she actually, um, she was born in a, in a town very close to Shanghai called Taichang. And her father was a principal of a high school. And uh, she obviously was very, very bright, very determined, very passionate about science. And she came to this country in 1960s and received her PhD uh, working on experimental nuclear physics um, uh, from Berkeley. I, 
I'm not 100% sure, but I think her advisor was Lawrence, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. And her, I mean, she, as in the introduction, already said that she uh, has made a major impact in physics, in science, but her, I would say that her most famous uh, work, which everybody talk about whenever they connect or uh, uh, mention her name, is the experimental um, demonstration clearly the parity uh, symmetry violation in uh, beta decay, which is a weak interaction. Mm -hmm. um, the other two very, very well-known physicists, uh, which has uh, uh, Chinese origin, uh, uh, C.N. Yang and uh, T.D. Li, so in the 50s, um, they actually proposed the idea that, you know, parity may not be a good symmetry in weak interaction. When they look at data, they don't really see the kind of evidence supporting that. So they were very brave to propose this idea of parity is violated. You know, physicists, we like simple, beautiful thing, right? Mm -hmm. Symmetry should be good, right? If it's broken, you know, it's like unthinkable, right? right. So, um, and Martin Wu, and she was not the only one, but she and other number of physicists, um, they actually very quickly um, published uh, at least three experiments, clearly demonstrated that um, parity is violated in weak interactions. Okay. And so when you've mentioned symmetry a couple times, is that looking at kind of the symmetry between matter and antimatter, or does it go beyond that? Well, the symmetry I am talking about here is um, parity is like a mirror or mm -hmm. kind of reflection. And, you know, hopefully when you look at yourself in the mirror, you think that your image just look like you, right? And if you look different in your mirror, I'm sure it's the mirror problem, right? <laughs> um, so not the symmetry problem. Um, so what we're talking about here is, for example, parity symmetry is means that um, if I, you know, I'm looking at things in three-dimensional space in this way, uh, you know, using this vector, mm -hmm. if I look at everything going to the opposite of that vector, sh should my physics change? And, you know, p physicists believe that it shouldn't change, right? Okay. And, but apparently in weak interaction case, such as neutron beta decay, it does look differently. Okay. So the idea then is physicists wanted to uh, uh, look for those quantity. Okay, you try to measure in your laboratory. And you look at how this quantity or observable will behave. If I say I'm going to look at this quantity in my mirror world, means the parity transformed world. If that quantity actually will somehow change sign, okay? And then in the laboratory, when you uh, actually uh, measure this quantity, which is not zero, and that tells you symmetry is violated. Because okay. if it's zero, I don't mind whether it changes sign or doesn't change sign. Zero is zero. Mm -hmm. But if I see something non-zero, and I know this quantity actually will flip, will change sign, and that tells me the symmetry is violated. Okay. So the point is, once Yang and the Li propose this idea, and then physicists like Martin Wu right away realize that you know there are certain quantities I can measure, I can test this. Mm -hmm. And so she went to a National Institute of Standard to collaborate with low temperature physicists. Um, and they did this experiment. And interestingly, the experiment also needed uh, 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 polarization, means the spin of the nucleus needs to be polarized. And at the time, they were using a People still use that, using extremely low temperature and very, very strong magnetic field. Okay. So that's, that sounds similar to your work. Did she influ influence you at all? Um, I, I think that she actually influenced a lot of people who wanted to become physicists and mm -hmm. maybe a lot more, maybe perhaps Chinese women physicists. So absolutely. And also, I think that the fact that I decided to pursue uh, experimental nuclear physics had a lot to do with, you know, she actually was an experimental nuclear physicist, and she, you know, grew up very near Shanghai, and I grew up, you know, um, I was born in Shanghai. So I think that, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We're going to take one of our questions from our viewer. This is from Nick in Salt Lake City. He says, is the signal from neutron spin similar to the signal from electron spin resonance or nuclear magnetic resonance? And if so, what would be a potential application? Um, Okay, so um, the uh, um, the nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, well, okay, so first of all, uh, maybe just back up mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, this is a good question, and um, so electron is also, uh, electron just like, uh, uh, like neutron when it comes to spin, means that it is also a spin one-half particle, mm -hmm. and as I mentioned, that spin is a very important uh, 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 property of particle. 
And the, of course, the one difference, major difference between electron and the neutron is that electron we call a point-like particle, means it does not have internal structure. You really can think about this as a point. Okay. But neutron is not. It has internal structure and has quarks and gluon inside. And uh, when it comes to, so, so, so now, and also very importantly, uh, electron mass is very small and neutron is a lot heavier. So, um, um, so basically the mass of the uh, neutron is about, about um, 2,000 times roughly of the uh, mass of the electron. And in fact, in fact, electron um, magnetic moment is much, much bigger than the, uh, um, than the, uh, um, than the neutron and because of the mass. And um, so the signal, yes, will be, uh, will be different um, compared with, um, with um, uh, electrons. Okay. Right. And any potential applications? Uh, that was one of the questions. Well, that's actually a very good question because um, you know, we are just very used to thinking about um, the um, application of uh, nuclear magnetic resonance or magnetic imaging, and this is all based on the picture you know, in our bodies, we have so many uh, uh, water molecules, and inside water molecules we have hydrogen atoms, and inside hy hydrogen atoms we have so many protons, and that's basically the whole idea. If you put a patient you know, in a strong magnetic field, and because of the, uh, uh, the spin one half of the proton, you actually will have line ali alignment of the spin, and so that's how people do. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I don't actually know people use electron and to do a medical application, but we definitely use electron in the laboratory environment when we do a, a resonance a, a measurement also. Okay. People can do electron a magnetic resonance measurement also. Okay. So we have another question. This comes from Jack Levitin. And he says, the Duke Today story about you says your parents made you spend your summers working on <laughs> physics and mathematics problems <laughs> instead of having fun with your friends. <laughs> this makes me think of the recent controversy about Amy Chua's book, a battle hymn of the tiger mother. Some people say parents who push their children should be praised for demanding excellence of them, while others say they are too demanding. What do you think? And was your mother a tiger mother? Um, thanks for the excellent question, because this is something uh, my son and I always talk all the time, and I even discuss with my colleagues sometimes, because um, first of all, my mother, um, she actually is not, uh, is not a tiger mother. And my father is not a tiger uh, father either, uh, although they influence both my sister and myself a lot. But in a way, I think that they always made it clear that uh, education is very important, and um, they will support both my sister and myself uh, pursuing whatever we are interested. But we should work very hard on whatever we are very interested. But they don't micromanage what we should be interested how much time we should really, you know, put. But I think that, um, and um, in terms of parents um, being, uh, you know, tiger mother or not, um, and I, I think, I, I think it's, it, you know, I, I think it's really important for children to have their time and space to explore, to really be a kid when they're young, and to be able to find what they like. But I think that uh, parents, of course, whenever they can, should provide the kind of opportunities for them to have chance to try different things uh, if they you know, are in a position to do so. But I think fundamentally it is just education is very important, and that is something we all can do uh, to emphasize the importance of education. Okay. So that actually, I, I'm going to end with this question, but this is a question from Jeffrey Mock. He says, a question about high school education. What is the... What are the essential points of knowledge about the atom that we should be teaching in high school physics? And why do you think it's important for high school students to study the atom? That's a very, very uh, good question. And I think that atom is essentially, you know, now thinking about, even though we say 4% is visible matter in the whole universe, right? It's like so insignificant. But, you know, you and I all live in visible world, mm -hmm. right? So everything is visible. Uh, matter means everything is about atoms. Mm -hmm. So therefore, um, when I think about atoms, it, it's really a wonderful world wh which you can learn so much. That is the foundation or basis for modern physics and very important for chemistry 
and very important, I think, for biology and material science. So I, I just cannot emphasize enough about the importance of studying atoms. And also, it is also very important um, to uh, give students the impression that even though atom is every day in our life, we still don't know everything about atom, right? Remember, what we started by talking about the nucleus, which is at the heart of the atom. Then you have an electron orbiting around the atom, right? And the nucleus, what are the nucleus made of? Neutrons, neutron and proton. Mm -hmm. We don't really know why neutron is neutral, why proton has charge one, right? Why the mass are so close but not quite? Why proton is stable but neutron decays, mm -hmm. right? And uh, why they have spin one half? Where does spin coming from? So I think that um, it is important to let the student know that uh, have appreciation for the beauty of atom and how important it is, but still encourage them to ask more questions. Do we understand everything? The answer is no, we don't. So we need more uh, youngsters to be interested and inspired and motivated to carry on, you know, mm -hmm. the uh, um, uh, adventure of trying to understand more about uh, subatomic uh, a world. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time. I'd like to thank all our viewers, and I hope you'll tune in next week. We'll be hearing from Adrian Bejan about his new book, Case for a Constructal Law of Nature. Thank you, Ashley. <laughs>